Hi, my roots are atrocious, but I decided to embrace this as a 24-7 camera from Haikyuu cosplay because, similarly to him, I can't be bothered. If you're wondering about the mask, I've decided to wear it until every country has gotten its fair share of vaccines, which, judging by the honestly impressive incompetence of our world's leaders, will take a while. Lastly, not that I ever had an upload schedule, and not that I plan on getting one anytime soon, but I recently moved. Countries. So making videos was so far down on my priority list because mentally, just the thought of doing any kind of research into nudism, <laughs> that was not it. However, moving to a new place with no friends, no family, and nothing to do, because the reason I moved is for my master's degree and it hasn't started yet, that gave me a lot of time to read. A genre I've been stuck on for a few years now, actually, is the 70s. More specifically, New York in the 70s and its underground art and music scene. Closely linked to the tragedy that is substance addiction and later on the AIDS crisis. I'm not heavily into booktube or anything, but I do like looking on YouTube what other people had to say and there's not much on YouTube about this, so I decided to fill this niche for you in case you're interested. And to make this a bit more hip and fun, I'll put this in a tier list because that's what all the cool people do now and... Oh, I don't care to be cool. Whatever, I'll do a tier list. This is kind of a, if you like this, you might like this kind of thing. I hope you find something that's of interest to you and I'll just get into it. Actually, one more disclaimer. When I compiled this list, I was confronted with how incredibly not diverse it was, um, largely honestly due to the fact that the scene was not very diverse at the time. But if you do have recommendations, I'd really appreciate that. So please leave them down below. And now I'll start. I will begin with the book that started it all. Actually, what started it was For Your Own Good by Alice Miller, a Swiss former psychoanalyst specialized in researching the possible consequences of child rearing, so hitting children or denying them love and affection as a means to make them obedient. It's obviously a really heavy topic, but also an extremely important one, because she argues that childhood trauma can lead to either inwardly or outwardly expressed destructive behavior, which she demonstrates using Jürgen Bach, a serial killer targeting children, Adolf Hitler and Christiane F. as examples. At no point does she attempt to excuse particularly Hitler's and Bach's behavior. She tries to explain it. Childhood trauma does not turn everybody into literal mass murderers or even bad people, but we have to acknowledge the possibility of trauma contributing to that development. That's what she tries to demonstrate using these three very extreme examples, but they were all so interesting, and especially Christiana F. stood out to me because I knew the least about her. Even though Zoo Station, the book I'm going to be talking about, is very much considered a German classic and often even read in schools. The reason being, it's basically the story that broke the heroin crisis to the public in a way that was not dismissive or disrespectful towards the people affected by it, instead actually humanizing them. Initially, it was published in Stern, a German magazine, and told the story of Christiane F., who was only 15 or so at the time when these interviews were conducted, but she'd actually slipped into addiction and prostitution at the age of 12. What this publication did was shine a light on the multiple factors that led to that, very much trying to eradicate the stigma that addiction is solely the addict's fault. To this day, many struggle to view addiction as the mental illness that it is. This report made a great attempt, and I believe it was rather successful, at not only humanizing so-called junkies, but also uncovering the many systemic reasons that lead to addiction. And, of course, it brought this underground problem into the public not with the most long-lasting effect, sadly. Because if you look around now, you think we don't have that issue anymore, when in reality, we're just really good at sweeping ugly problems under the rug. 
making it easier for all of us, but especially for people in power to ignore and keep them from investing in preventative measures. But that's why reading this book literally changed my life. I was probably more aware of addiction than most because it's something family members struggle or have struggled with. This book was incredibly eye-opening though in many ways, particularly concerning drugs and drug addiction, which is why I 100% recommend it. It's essentially edited interviews with Christiana, making it very colloquial. The first person perspective you get into this world though is striking, even if it's not literary gold. So stylistically, it's an easy read. Content-wise, definitely not. There's a movie as well that came out a few years after in the early 80s. I'd say if you're interested, check it out. Personally, even though I didn't expect a dark, super explicit film from the 80s, this was almost too harmless. Don't get me wrong, there's some pretty striking scenes in there. And reading the book, Christiana doesn't describe everything as completely terrible, but the movie lacked some of the edge, from today's perspective at least. Or maybe I just can't look beyond the awkward acting. They used actual children to reenact this, so I get that it's gonna be a bit more awkward, but it was hard to get through sometimes. David Bowie even has a cameo in it though, so if nothing else convinced you that this was a big fucking deal, this should. Ranking-wise, it's a movie. Or actually, maybe why is this a movie? They're currently making a TV show, and I'll be honest, I think they're kind of milking this in an inappropriate way, considering Christiana F. is a real person, and this is real trauma she went through, and she stated multiple times that she really regrets having done these interviews. So I feel like they could use this budget to tell a story of addiction in the modern world, making it more relatable to teens nowadays. I don't know. I'm not a fan of them still milking this to this day, but I won't even get started on how fucked up the media was towards Christiana. That's a whole whole other story for itself. It's it's awful though. It it was awful. She actually wrote another book, I think in 2008 about her life after Zoo Station was published and <sighs> that woman went through so much shit, so it's bad. I recommend the second book too. I'm not sure if that one was translated though, so it might only be available in German. Let's change continents though, because this book didn't at all hit the brief of the title of this video actually. So let's take another book that doesn't actually hit the brief that well, because it takes place in the 60s instead of the 70s, but I found it relevant and kind of like a setup. You know, time is fluid and all. I think it still fits the list well enough. A Free Wheel in Time, Memoir of Greenwich Village in the 60s. While it's called Memoir of Greenwich Village, it's also a telling of Bob Dylan's early days before he became the artist we know today. And it's done in a very intimate way since the author, Suze Rotolo, who is also an artist, was his partner for a while. So the first half was quite interesting because it was about Bob Dylan and how the scene was at the time. It was quite fascinating. The second half, in the second part of the book, the focus shifts to the author, though, and away from Dylan, which is not inherently a bad thing. But I think because I didn't know the author and I, I looked up her art, it's not really my thing. I kind of lost interest. And this, for me at least, is a common problem with memoirs, because when there's nobody I recognize as part of the narrative, it's hard for me to get or stay invested. So uh, if there was ever a 5 out of 10 book, this is kind of the one. It could be really, really interesting to you, especially if you're a huge Bob Dylan fan. My mom's a huge Bob Dylan fan. She loved it. But um, for me, I don't know very average. Uh, not bad by any means, just nothing I'd pick up again. 
As far as I can remember, though, the writing was nice. Um, I don't know. F five out of ten for me. It's a book. Just Kids by Patti Smith, on the other hand. Oh my lord. This was overall a beautiful reading experience. The melancholic, romantic, and in parts tragic atmosphere Smith created and the emotion it evoked in me was incredible. And additionally, the stories she told were actually fascinating. It starts with her coming to New York and meeting Robert Maplethorpe, who became a photographer very well known for his explicit imagery. <laughs> Their relationship that was very complex and intense becomes a large part of the narrative. Now, I'm a total sucker for interesting characters, character development, and unusual relationship dynamics. So this book delivered on every level. I wasn't that familiar with Smith or Maplethorpe, but the book made me interested. And this is actually what kicked off my New York craze because it captured the scene so well and so intriguingly, and even the mundane stories Smith tells were interesting, or lovely, or just entertaining. I, can't, I don't know, there was not a moment reading this book where I felt bored, or like I wanted to skip a chapter or skip a few pages. It was just, from beginning till end, a really wonderful tale. What was so fascinating about their relationship, though, was that there was clearly so much love between the two, and they were kind of each other's muses, but at the same time, they were never the other person's number one, because art was always in that spot, which led to a lot of hurt as well. So it was just a relationship I have never experienced myself, I have never witnessed in friends or family. It, it was just fascinating, truly. This could have been a documentary. I looked, there is not really a documentary on the two. There's interesting documentaries on Robert Maplethorpe and Patti Smith individually though, so if you're interested, there's enough content out there. But this book is just absolutely stunning. It was, was it life-changing though? I'd say yes. I'll put it in life-changing. 20th Century Boy by Duncan Hanna. This is another one that was so fucking entertaining. Duncan Hanna can only be described as a charming bastard. He has a personality so far removed from my own that I could only marvel at the metaphorical balls this guy had. Duncan Hanna is a painter who I also knew nothing about, which as you can tell is kind of a common theme here. And the book is basically his edited diary entries. So similarly to Rotolo, it's a deeply personal narrative. Hannah manages to make it entertaining though. He's essentially the definition of a social butterfly, leading to him constantly being at some party, meeting rock stars, meeting artists, just hanging out with Andy Warhol and sitting in a cab with David Bowie and shit, acting in films because he was quite an attractive dude. I can definitely see people disliking his character because in modern terms, he'd probably considered to be a fuckboy, but he's a fuckboy that likes to name drop, so... The book offers so many little stories of famous people kind of behind the scenes or off stage, characterizing them in a way you usually don't get to see. It was an easy read, not the best writing in the world, but it was very enjoyable. It offered great insight into the artist scene, mostly without heroin, although Duncan Hanna was definitely on some substances more often than not. But it wasn't as dark as some of the other books I'll be talking about. And there's pictures. I love me a good memoir with some pictures in it. There's nothing better. So definitely good times. Widow Basquiat by Jennifer Clement. This one's interesting because it's written by Jennifer Clement, who was a friend of Jean Basquiat's partner, Suzanne Malouk, whom she writes about, while indirectly also characterizing Jean Basquiat through descriptions of the two's relationship. 
Were you able to follow? I hope so. <laughs> Somehow, Clement manages to make it extremely intimate, though, which I find remarkable, her not having been part of the experiences she writes about. It's a very short book, so you don't get an in-depth retelling of either one of their lives. It's not focused on him as an artist or her as a person so much, but you feel like you know them and you do get to understand the tragic nature of their childhoods, their relationship, and both their struggles with drugs and ultimately his tragic death. This is a short, not sweet, but quite lyrical and atmospherical glimpse into the scene of the 80s in New York. I'll put this in good times, but not in a fun way. It definitely made me read more about Basquiato because he was incredibly talented and seemingly also deeply troubled, which makes it sound like I'm into tragedy point. But my interest lies more in the complexity of artists that usually have quite extreme personalities and worldviews far removed from my own reality. Uh, she said, trying to justify her thirst for tragedy. Speaking of tragedy, and I don't want to live this life by Deborah Spungen. This one needs a fucking category of its own. I've come to terms with the fact that I can start crying over benign things. Usually, some kind of visual stimulation is needed though, not in this case, baby. We're talking <laughs> full body sobs and hysterical crying at three in the morning, followed by a rough fucking night. You may have heard of Sid and Nancy. I, surprise, had not. Sid and Nancy's relationship essentially contains everything bad and everything that keeps me awake at night. No matter what angle you look at this from, it's completely heart-shattering, and the worst part, it's so relevant. For those of you not aware of the two, Sid is Sid Vicious, the bass player from the UK band The Sex Pistols. Nancy is a groupie from Pennsylvania originally, though she then moved to New York City. How did the two meet? Nancy was deeply infatuated with Jerry Nolan, drummer of the New York Dolls and the Heartbreakers. He rejected her, she wanted to kill herself. Friends convinced her not to do that and go to London instead, where she met Sid and they began their complicated and, quite frankly, very unhealthy relationship. Sid, or John Simon Ritchie, had the look that was gaining popularity at the time and was recruited by manager Malcolm McLaren as the bass player for the Sex Pistols without actually knowing how to play bass which in my eyes is just setting him up for failure and that's exactly what happened. The thing that made their relationship so incredibly toxic was not a lack of love though, quite the contrary. They were very much dependent on each other. The reason for that being that they were both individually extremely mentally ill. And that's exactly what And I Don't Want to Live This Life by Deborah Spungen, Nancy's mother is about. Nancy was briefly mentioned in a few other books I'll be talking about and was consistently described as being hard to be around. She could be aggressive verbally and physically, very impulsive and generally unpredictable in her behavior. In the book, the mother describes how, essentially from birth, Nancy was not a normal child. She showed early signs of severe mental illness, but it being the 60s, her parents, especially her mother, who tried her best to get help, was not taken seriously. Professionals would look for faults in her parenting, and only when it became clear through Nancy's vicious behavior that better parenting practices wouldn't help, they started prescribing her heavy medication when she was a literal infant. Her mother believes that's the reason Nancy struggled with addiction in her later life, she was always on something, started when she was a baby. However, psychiatrists apparently never bothered to give her parents a diagnosis, so only after her death did they learn that Nancy was probably schizophrenic. Now, combine schizophrenia with an extreme drug addiction, 
and you'll have a very unstable person. Similarly to Sid. His mother was an addict, and it's alleged that she got him hooked on heroin by giving him his first dose for his 16th birthday. <sighs> he was then exploited by Malcolm McLaren, the manager of the Sex Pistols, for his look. And when the band didn't work out, he was spit out and left to fend for himself. Keep in mind, he was 19 or 20 when basically everything fell apart. If you're below that age, that might seem old. I'm 24 and I can assure you, at 19, you're a fucking baby. I'm unsure about other mental health issues he had, but I would assume there was more besides the addiction because his upbringing was just not great for any child to emerge unscathed from. So combine these two extremely mentally ill people that have been or felt that they have been mistreated all their lives, add heroin and the atrocious treatment from the media in there, and you've got Sid and Nancy. As if all of this wasn't bad enough already, it all reached a terrible climax. Allegedly, and this was never proven, many people close to the two actually doubt this, Sid stabbed Nancy to death under the influence of multiple substances. She died curled up under a sink at the age of 20. Again, so fucking young. The reason this case was never concluded was because after Sid got out on bail, he died from an overdose. I believe it's unclear if it was intentional or not. I think it was. Because as toxic as their relationship was, and it was, it truly was not healthy, it was also so clear that they loved each other more than anything in the world. Because the other person was all they had. And to get back to the book, the title, And I Don't Want to Live This Life, is actually a quote from one of the letters Sid wrote to Nancy's mother while he was in jail. These letters were included in the book, and they are what just broke me. This story isn't just about two tragic deaths, it's about two tragic lives filled with pain from beginning to end. And while this particular case is beyond heartbreaking, what pains me so much is knowing that so many people are living this way. Young people that never get the chance to experience life being a joyous thing because they were failed by everybody. Oh, bitch, I'm crying. If there is one thing I'd criticize about the book, it's that sometimes I felt like I was reading things I shouldn't be, like Deborah Spongeon was oversharing on some facts about her daughter's life, since that is what the focus of the story mainly is. Uh, Sid is more like a side character towards the end. <laughs> same time who am I to judge because one thing I found incredibly interesting about this book was that Spongeon breaks this notion of especially mothers being expected to unconditionally love their children no matter what or they're considered an incompetent or bad parent now under normal circumstances it is m my belief that if you're not going to love your child unconditionally then you shouldn't have a child. But this case was so extreme and Spongeon shares her inner struggle, wanting to love her child, but at the same time, that child being so incredibly destructive of not only her parents' relationship, but also the lives of her siblings, that it became increasingly hard to unconditionally love Nancy. And Again, I've never experienced that, thankfully, but it was interesting getting that insight into this struggle that her entire family had regarding Nancy. And something else Spongeon went into, Deborah Spongeon, the mother, was when her daughter was found, how she was treated as the mother of a murdered person. And she actually started, I think, an initiative for the families of murder victims, because of course the murdered person is the main victim, but 
that extends towards their family, if they're close-knit, which Nancy's family was. And it was a very dehumanizing experience for all of them. So she also uncovers that issue we have. And that was another thing I hadn't thought about because I have never experienced murder, thankfully, and I hope I never will, knock on wood. But uh, yeah, overall, this book was very eye-opening in many ways, incredibly heartbreaking, so heartbreaking. But it, I recommend it a lot. Um, if you're mentally maybe a little bit shaky or unstable, don't, don't, just don't, because uh, it is intense. This was one of the most intense books I've ever read in my entire life. But if you have the mental capacity and you know that you can get through this without falling apart, I think it's worth reading and investing your time. But let's move on, oh my god. <laughs> Please Kill Me by Legs McNeil and Gillian McCain. This is a fun one. Thankfully, we needed this after, after the sponge in one. So it's essentially interview excerpts just taking you through the history of punk, starting with the MC5, the New York Dolls, the Ramones, Iggy Pop, David Bowie, the Sex Pistols, and many more. It took some getting used to, especially not being familiar with most names, but once you got the hold of it, it was a fascinating read and really fun. But although it was kind of like all in good fun, I genuinely felt like I learned a lot about the scene and how it started in the US and then kind of going into the UK. You do learn some uncomfortable truths about some of those musicians, but um, apart from that, it's pretty lighthearted. It definitely makes mentions of drugs because they were everywhere, but it wasn't as haunting to me as the Deborah Spongen book was, for example. So, I mean, I don't know if it could trigger people, I think, but... Um, I don't know. I felt like I came out knowing and understanding a lot more about the industry, about punk, obviously, about not even so much politics. The American punk was not as political as the British punk, it seems. That's, but see, that's something I learned by reading this book. So it was really a, a great fucking time. That's, that's all I have to say about it. I recommend it. Punk Avenue? Mm. Punk Avenue tried to do what Please Kill Me did, but more focused on the author's band, The Senders, and it kind of paled in comparison, especially since I read them back to back. So of the two, I recommend Please Kill Me more for a better overall impression and understanding of the scene. If you are particularly interested or a fan of The Senders, this was a fine book. Phil seemed like a sweet guy. I think he was the friend who helped Nancy after her rejection by Jerry Nolan, so it was an interesting crossover, and he is also mentioned in Please Kill Me, so there's not much else to say. I recommend Please Kill Me, but this was a fine book. I'm conflicted on this next one, Johnny Thunders in Cold Blood by Nina Antonia. Though I can appreciate how thoroughly it was obviously researched and written, uh, the author being a friend of Johnny Thunders, and I think the majority of it being written while he was still alive, I had two gripes with it. The first one being the writing. It was hard for me to get into. It's not a thick book, but it took me so long to finish. I, I, it wasn't bad writing, per se, but something about it was very hard and heavy for me. Also, some of the descriptions of the concerts were not it. I don't know if it's a, a general thing for me that I just don't enjoy vivid descriptions of things that are just better being experienced, like concerts, like sunsets, or things like that. Or if the way these were written were just truly trying too hard. I. I just actively disliked those scenes. My other issue was that even after over 200 pages about Johnny Thunders, I still felt like I didn't know him. Maybe it was because the writing was in the way for me to get into, but despite knowing him personally as a friend, it still came across as a memoir very much focused on his artist persona. The reader barely getting glimpses 
beyond that. And I guess that's just not really my thing. On the other hand, that may have been her intention. So I don't want to hold it against her. And I will say it did go into great detail about him as an artist and his career and his influence on other artists and other musicians and the punk scene in general. So if that is something you're interested in, this is definitely worth checking out. I think for me personally, it was just the writing making it hard for me to stay invested. There was one quote in particular that did stand out to me though, because Thunders, like many at the time, struggled heavily with a heroin addiction. And his friend slash manager, Christopher Gierke, oh, he's German, Christopher Gierke, said about Thunders and Nolan, we all have to make decisions. They're not leprous outcasts with some fatal disease. They are very privileged and talented and fortunate. If only they could see those privileges and talents. There are so many junkies living without talent, without hope and attention, which is harsh, but kind of true. Mental illness is always horrendous, no matter how rich or famous a person is. But having a passion and people around you, supporting you, caring for you, is a massive privilege many people don't have. Mental illness becomes their entire life because there's nothing and nobody on the outside reminding them that that is not the case, making it so utterly hopeless and crippling. There's a really great, if incredibly heartbreaking documentary on YouTube following a young girl who started heroin very early and they follow her for, I think, almost two decades. When they first interview her, she says something along the lines of, I can stop whenever I want to. The next time they interview her, she's still only 14 or 15 at this point, she had already given up hope to ever overcome the addiction. And sadly, she never did. Such a young girl, already having given up on life, was heart-shattering. Again, it's so depressing to think that that's the reality of many people. And our governments choose to look away. Which actually brings me to another recommendation on Netflix. The documentary is called Sanpa, um, short for San Patrignano. I'm butchering all the Italian, I'm so sorry. San Patrignano was a commune for the treatment of addicts, founded by Vincenzo Muccioli in 1978, when the government was basically still ignoring the heroin crisis, pretty much just letting people die. Now, as much as I respect the efforts in that commune, a lot of shady shit did go down. Um, so I don't at all condone a lot of the practices, but it was very touching to see the people that got a second chance in life because somebody believed in them and gave them support, unconditional support, no matter how often they ran away or or relapsed, Vincenzo was there and he would bring them back and he would put them to work and let them study. And it was beautiful and very emotional for me. So if it is available in your country or if you have VPN or something, not sponsored, maybe one day, then I definitely recommend checking it out. It was so fascinating. I had never heard of this commune, and it's still running today with more ethical practices now, so I think we're good in that regard. But uh, yeah, just fascinating. Please check it out. Sorry, back to the books now. The last one, Smash Cut by Brad Gooch. I bet you wondered why there's a, why is this a book category in this tier list? Well, it's for this baby. The premise sounded very much up my alley. It takes place between the late 70s and 80s in New York, and it's a memoir, again, about the author's time as a model and being in a relationship with the aspiring filmmaker Howard, who sadly contracts AIDS and later passed away from it. I was very interested to gain insight into what the outbreak of the AIDS crisis must have been like for gay men at the time, that's hardly what this book was about, though, even though it was kind of sold as that being the main premise. So they bamboozled me. 
The setup of the story makes it seem like Brad, the author, and Howard, his partner, would be the main protagonists. But he quickly moves away from that and instead goes on about his experiences as a model in Europe, Howard only re-entering the picture towards the end when he got his diagnosis. When the storyline centered around Howard's decline in health, Gooch proved that he is very capable of evoking a strong emotional response from the reader. That was absolutely gut-wrenching. How then is it that the rest of the book is so bland and uninteresting? Every person he introduces, he does in a way where I literally could not care less. Like, I'm sure Brad is a nice guy, but I don't care about Brad in this story either. I don't know how he... It wasn't great. And his descriptions of his model life were also not interesting. Maybe if I was more into fashion and I recognized more of the names, it could have been fun for me, but I really struggled getting through this one. And I know for a fact, having read all these other memoirs, that I don't need to know every person in the story, and not every story has to be super exciting or dramatic for me to stay interested and entertained. I like mundane stories if they're entertainingly written, which this just was not. These stories are fine as diary entries, you know, for yourself to look back on and remember, but I don't understand why this was made into a book. No disrespect to the author, of course. He has it in him. He can write really well, but this just needed a clearer focus and a lot more editing. So there you have it. 11 books and two documentaries. I outdid myself. I hope you found something of interest. Uh, obviously, a lower ranking one for me shouldn't discourage you from reading something. And just because I adored a book doesn't mean you're gonna adore it. I just wanted to provide a starting point if you're interested in this general time or theme because it is something very close to my heart. And I think everyone and society as a whole would benefit if we were more aware of things like addiction still being an issue. You know, just reminding ourselves that how fucking awfully <laughs> our governments fail so many people every single day since forever. Wow, what a positive end to a video. If you have recommendations, please leave them down below. That would be greatly appreciated. One book on my reading list is And the Band Played On, I think. I don't know the author. It's about the AIDS crisis, so once I've read that, I might update in the description or in a comment down below in case anybody's interested. Uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Be considerate. Keep your mask on, even if you're fully vaccinated. And see you next time, whenever that may be.